Now, in around 550 AD, Ireland boasted 150 warrior kings for a population of half a million. <laughs> now, what we know of the habits of the Scotty, which is how the Irish were known by outsiders, the Scotty, the war band mentality of the men of darkness, this is basically bad news. In the mind of each king, there were always 149 kings too many. <laughs> After the death of Patricius in around 490, Ireland seems to have entered a time of particularly savage intertribal warfare. Having built up their wealth and morale by plundering Britain in the 5th century, they now seem to have turned inward to devour each other in endless bids for preeminence. Each midget king strove to outdo the other, to establish himself as top man in a warrior pecking order that stretched throughout Ireland and much of what we now call Scotland. This was a sort of ranking order of the World Series Irish style, fought out to the death with harsh iron. And the great hope of each king was that their family might eventually end up at the top of the league. It was a very bloody struggle for the high kingship, for the position of Audrey. Many kings lost out in battles which seems to have become increasingly bloodthirsty. We have the later poem ascribed to one such unlucky king, King Sweeney, the song of Mad Sweeney. Endlessly over the water, birds of the barn are singing, sweeter to me their voices than any church bells ringing. Over the plain of Moira, under the heels of foemen, I saw my people broken as flax is scutched by women. But the cries I hear by Derry are not of men triumphant. I hear their calls in the evening, swans calm and exultant. I hear the stags belling over the valley steepness. No music on earth can move me like its sweetness. O oh Christ! Christ, hear me. Christ, Christ, in thy meekness. Christ, Christ, love me. Sever me not from your sweetness. As the poem of Mad Sweeney makes plain, for an out-of-work warlord, the Christian monastery began to look good. <laughs> the monastery emerged in this time as the still eye of the storm in a world of constant violence. It was a sanctuary for the defeated and for the disgusted. Here at last was the right sort of war band. A war band as tightly organized, as loyal to its leader as any band of young thugs on the warpath. But it was a war band of men now gathered together to serve in peace Christ, the true High King of Heaven. Grant me, sweet Christ, the grace to find Son of the Living God, a small hut on a lonesome spot to make it my abode, a little pool but very clear to stand beside the place where all men's sins are washed away by sanctifying grace. My choice of men to live with me and pray to God as well, quiet men of humble mind, their number I shall tell two by two, my dozen friends to tell the number right, praying with me to move that king who gives the sun its light. A lovely church, a home for God, bedecked with linen fine, where once over the white gospel page the gospel candle shine. My share of clothing and of food from the king of fairest face, and I to sit at times alone and pray in every place. 
But for an Irishman of the warrior upper class, the cost of attaining this peace was truly awesome. It was self-imposed exile. It was firmly believed that one could only truly serve God if one left one's tribe and one's native land. And in a society where everything depended on the support provided by one's family and by one's fellow tribesmen, to be an exile in this way was not just a sort of shove off on a sort of amiably hippie Coca-Cama trail. It was to be brutally shorn of one's social identity. It was to become an unperson. It was to wander as a total stranger among strangers who had no social relation to you whatsoever, though they were not kin. The Irish had a very harsh word for it, and it's on the handout, under the map, turn around for the map. The exile was a glass literally a grey dog, a wolf. And the wolf was a creature thought of by the Irish as the dog gone wild. It had cut its links with the domestic world of the family, with the tame animals on the farm. It now wandered like a flitting grey shade on the edge of the settled land. The exile was a human wolf chased out of his own land like vermin. This is what it meant for a monk to become an exile. We often speak of the Irish monks as pilgrims for the love of God. And this conjures up a rather upbeat image of spiritual tourists and jet-set professors. It doesn't get the harshness of the state of exile from family, from friends, from homeland, which the word pilgrimage implied at this time. The old Irish term is more precise. The pilgrim was, again, I refer you to it, a theorade, a man given over to God. That is a person taken out of normal life with the hand of God upon him, and whether for curse or blessing, only the future could tell. Some of the most poignant poems of exile ever written in any language were written by Irish warriors on their way to seek a new life of self-imposed exile in a monastery. Shall I go then, O king of the mysteries, after my fill of cushions and music, to turn my face to the shore and my back to my native land. Without the heady drink that intoxicates a throng, without a stout tribe, without retainers to protect me, without cup, ale, or drinking horn. Now this is what happened in 563 AD to a man of royal lineage in Donegal now known to us as Columba. Columba was later known as Columkill, the dove of the church. But he did not begin as a dove. He came from a long and successful family of hawks. He was born in 521, Within his lifetime, Christianity changed from being the religion of a minority, still largely associated with the Romano-British slaves to whom Patricius had ministered, to become at least the nominal faith of powerful and highly combative royal clans. And the clan of Columba was the most combative of all. He belonged to the Kennel Connell, the kindred of Connell, of Donegal and Tyrone in Northwest Ireland. They were O'Neill descendants of the great Neil of the Nine Hostages, the former High King of Ireland. It was the fleets of Neil of the Nine Hostages which had carried the terrible Scotty, the Sea Rovers, the Men of Darkness, across the Irish Sea to drain what remained of Roman Britain 
of its wealth and population, it is therefore quite probable that it was a slave raiding spree of the great grandfather of Columba, which brought the young Tricius as a slave from northern Britain to County Mayo in Western Ireland. The warrior retinues of the northern Abe O'Neills really did mean business, and in 561 they defeated their cousins, the rightful kings of Tara, at an unusually bloody battle at Cuildrebene. Though already a clergyman, Columba had been somehow implicated in the battle. A few years later, in 563, he decided to leave Ireland as a deorade, as a self-imposed exile to do penance for his part in the escalating violence. Whether he was shocked by the slaughter or had actually been implicated in it through his family connections, we really don't know. What we do know is that he sailed northwards, a few days across the sea to what we now call Scotland. Here he settled in Iona and lived there until his death in 597. He would be remembered as the classic Irish exile for God. There is a grey eye that looks back at Ireland. It will never henceforth see the men of Ireland, nor their women. On the south shore of the island of Iona, there's a small hill. Columba was said to have walked to the top of this hill again and again, just to look out towards the southwest over the Atlantic, to make sure that the coast of his beloved Donegal was not visible. He had truly allowed his homeland to drop beneath the horizon. Once an exhausted heron, blown off course from Donegal, landed on the island. Take care of how you lift it up, Columba told his monks. Have pity for it, carry it to the nearby house. Look after it and feed it as our distinguished guest. Then he added sadly, for after three days it will no longer wish to be a pilgrim among us. It will return to the sweet land of Ireland from whence it came. Note that Columba deliberately picked an island for his place of exile. This was because, like our other Irish Christians, he had heard of the great desert of Egypt. He knew that at the very far end of the Christian world from where he lived, Christians had for centuries gone out into the desert to seek the total solitude, the total absence of settled society, which gave them the peace with which to worship God. He would have thoroughly approved of the Desert Fathers. We actually know that he did. He might even have approved of my talks about the Desert Fathers last year. That's not so certain, but I really gave those talks in part because last year and this year really make a home. Well, I gave those talks because the experiences of Coptic Christians of the Nile Valley of the 4th and 5th centuries from a world we feel we is very far away from us actually look directly towards the flowering monasticism at the far end of the world, in the Celtic world of the time of Columba. Scotland and Egypt are not as far apart in the Christian world as we sometimes are tempted to believe. Up to this time, many places in Ireland are called by the word desert, for every hermit's cell, every monastery where monks were gathered in Ireland was thought to be a little fragment of the great desert of Egypt, where monasticism had first begun. The problem, of course, is that in my sodden homeland, there are no deserts. So instead, Irish monks tended to place the great salt desert of the sea between themselves and the settled land the awful Skellig Michal rocks off the coast of Kerry are one such Celtic desert. 
These are a spectacular perching place, sticking up from the Atlantic. They're the last bit of land before you reach New Jersey. <coughs> they were suited only to monks and puffins. Iona was a more gentle island, ringed by the, he the hills of mainland Argyle. But between it and the mainland there lay that crucial band of the Hinbar Glass, the glass green sea, which set it off as a holy place. It was thought of as being cut off by the salt desert of the sea from normal social life, just as the great monasteries of Egypt were cut off from the life of the Nile by a narrow but clear belt of desert. Here was a world outside the world, delightful to think, I think it to be, in the bosom of an isle, on the peak of a rock, that I might often see there the calm of the sea, that I might see its heavy waves near the glittering ocean, that I might see its smooth strand of clear headlands, no gloomy thing, and the sound of the shallow waves against the rock. If you look at the map, one must remember that the monastery of Lindisfarne, off the coast, coast of Northumberland in northern England, was later founded by monks from Iona. It also is cut off from the mainland by tidal waters. It was to be the Iona of the south. It was a miniature Iona a holy place cut off from normal society by the desert of the sea, and it's still known to the locals as Holy Island. But this did not mean, in fact, that Ireland remained totally cut off from Columba. Far from it. And here we must think away modern political boundaries. Modern political boundaries have divided Ireland from what we now call Scotland, from what we now call England. But this wasn't so in the sixth century. It was the sea that mattered. And the sea joined the two coasts in a single unity. Iona was under 80 miles away by sea from Northern Ireland. And this sea was dominated at the time by the Irish, the Scotty, the sea rovers, the men of darkness, control the northern waters in their nine-bench rowboats from what is now Donegal in the Republic of Ireland all the way up the west coast of Scotland as far as the Hebrides. It is they, we must remember, who gave their name to what we now call Scotland because to any Roman or to any Romano-Britain who approached what we call Scotland from the south the very first settlements one would meet would be these settlements of the Scotty, the Irish Sea Rovers, solidly settled along the coastline of Galloway, Argyle, and pushing into the lowlands right across. Thus, Iona lay actually at the hub of the sea routes in a world dominated by Scotty before they had become Scotchmen. Patricius, as we saw last week, was always a bit out on a limb. By insisting on remaining in darkest Ireland, he cut himself off from his fellow Romans. He was always regarded by his Romano-British colleagues, as I pointed out, as basically the wrong man in the wrong place. But at Iona, Columba was the right man in exactly the right place. And we must remember what a new world this was. Patricius still belonged to the old world. He looked back always to Rome and Britain. His journeys probably took him from south of Hadrian's Wall across Central Ireland towards Mayo. But look at the map with the arrow showing the later influence exercised by the monastery of Iona. Iona stands at the top of an arch far to the north of Hadrian's Wall. It stands at the northernmost peak of this arch, which extends southwest, deep into the south of Ireland, 
southeast, deep as far as Lindisfarne and northern England. It's a world where England, Scotland, Ireland don't yet exist, but the shadow of Iona does. A man from a family of kings, Columba remained very much in many ways the spiritual high king of the northern waters, far beyond the frontiers of the Roman Empire. Columba's continued closeness to Ireland was always emphasised by stories about him which presented him as the classic Irish man of second sight. He was seen as a philid, as a seeing man, as a prophet in his own times, in a way that a man with his ear firmly placed on the grapevine that led back from Iona to the bloodthirsty politics of his homeland. Once, says his life, he heard his companions talking on the way about two kings in Ireland. My dear sons, he said, why do you gossip idly about these kings? For both of those you mentioned were recently killed by their enemies and their heads cut off. Sailors will arrive today from Ireland and will tell you this. <laughs> Thus, Iona remained very close to the heartbeat of the northern world. Yet, of course, in the imagination of contemporaries, it was also at an immense distance from it. It was engulfed in the salt desert of the sea. It was just beyond the horizon from Ireland. It was cut off from the mainland of what we now call Scotland by a stretch of glass green sea. This was the classic desert of Egypt, the home of the great monks of old, now recreated in a Celtic idiom, in the remoteness of an Atlantic offshore island. And there was a touch of paradise regained about the island. On Iona, it was believed, the hard laws of nature in a warrior society were believed to have been held in suspense. A knife blessed by Columba would no longer draw blood. Once, one of the brethren, Mola O'Brien by name, came to the saint while he was engaged in copying a manuscript and asked him, please bless this instrument which I have in my hand. So Columba did not look up, but continued to keep his eyes on the book from which he was copying. However, he reached out his hand a little way, still holding the pen, made the sign of the cross upon it. Then he asked his servant, Dermot, what was the influence, the implement that I blessed for my brother? Oh, it was a knife for the slaughtering of bulls and cattle. I trust in my Lord, added Columba, that the implement I have blessed will not hurt man or beast. And sure enough, when next the monks tried to slaughter a bullock, the knife wouldn't cut. <laughs> Having discovered this fact, the monks melted down the iron of that knife coated the liquid on it to all other iron tools in the monastery. From then on, these tools were unable to harm any flesh, for the power of the saint's blessing remained within them. This is disarmament, Celtic style. <laughs> to think of oneself as living in a monastery where iron drew no blood was to step from a world of warrior violence ruled by the sword into the peaceable kingdom of the holy mountain of the Lord, as in Isaiah 2.4. Nation shall not lift sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And for this reason also, the monks of Iona lingered poignantly on Columba's relations also with the animals of the monastery. By the end of his life, this exiled Kuglas, this wolf from the violent clan of the O'Neills, had seemed to have created a world where the original peace between men and men and even between the human race and the animal kingdom had for a moment been re-established. They described how the old sick Columba had walked for a last time around his island. The saint left the barn made his way back to the monastery. He had to rest halfway. As he sat there, for he was weary with age, as I have said, behold a white horse, the loyal workhorse which used to carry milk pails from the milking shed to the monastery, approached the saint. 
he put its head against his bosom and began to mourn like a person pouring out its tears into the saint's bosom and weeping aloud with foaming. Let him be, said Columba, let him that loves us pour out the tears of bitter mourning, for God, his creator, has clearly revealed to this animal that his master is soon on his way. So the word of the sword gave way to the world of prayer. And we must never forget the immense importance of intercessory prayer as the raison d'etre for the monastery, both in Egypt and in the Irish monastic world. I'm always relieved when something happens in the past that Rich has already preached about. <laughs> Last week it was Naaman and the little Hebrew girl, who of course is St. Patrick. Now, intercessory prayer. This is what turned these remote monasteries into powerhouses in the world, because it's their prayers which protected the world. There's a wonderful graffito written in Coptic on the wall of the monastery in Egypt looking out over the Nile Valley from the pyramid of Saqqara. This is the spot on which our Lord and Father, Upper Jeremiah, bowed himself in prayer until he had by his prayers removed the sins of the people of the whole world. But of course, in order to pray, the monks had to have books. And above all, they had to master the book of Psalms. For here I have a sad announcement. The monks of the Celtic Church on this point were not Episcopalians. <laughs> they had no book of common prayer. The book of Psalms was their book of common prayer. As for Augustine, as for the Desert Fathers, so for Columba and his monks, the Psalms were the true model of all Christian prayer. The good Irish monk was called Psalmbook, a man with the Psalms always in his mouth. No books, no Psalms. No Psalms, no proper and effective prayers to God on behalf of the world. To have a monastery without the Scriptures, and especially without the Psalms, was like trying to run a modern hospital without electricity. And in around 550 AD, Ireland was still a land almost entirely without books. It really takes a leap of the imagination to enter into this situation. But until the coming of Patricius, bearing Christian scriptures, Irishmen of all social levels were happily locked in a totally oral culture. Books seemed something utterly strange to them. And worse than that, the books that came might as well have come from the face of the moon. They were not in Irish, they were in Latin. I'll deal with the full implications of this situation in my next talk. All I need to say here is that at Iona, the urgent need for, for books, for books in Latin, was inextricably linked to the urgent need to pray. It was through patient copying of the Psalms in a Latin language which had arrived, as it were, from outer space, that Irishmen, Scotsmen, a little later Anglo-Saxons, began to read and write. For this reason, the patient work of copying the scriptures was the heart of Iona. One day Barthene went to the saint and said, I've need of one of the brothers to run through the correct and correct with me the Psalter I have written out. Hearing this, the saint spoke thus, Why do you impose this trouble upon us without cause, since this Psalter of yours, of which you speak, Neither will one letter be found to be superfluous, nor another to have been left out, except for one vowel I, which alone is missing. So when the whole salt had been read through, exactly what the saint had foretold was found to be confirmed. Only one letter I missing in the entire text. But if this is the text with which you speak to God, you've got to get it right. 101% right. And when Columba died, he was still at it, copying. 
When he'd come down from the hill and returned to the monastery, he sat in his hut writing out a copy of the Psalms. He reached that verse of the 34th Psalm where it is written, They that seek the Lord shall not want for anything that is good. Here at the end of the page, I must stop. Bethana writes what comes after. Here was a text in, in Latin, in a totally dead language, that had never been spoken in Ireland, and yet it was perfectly copied. The Celtic church was based in part on a real miracle of cultural transmission from one world to another. From the Roman heartland of Christianity had grown up, to a third world of a hitherto totally oral, non-literate culture. And we can see this page turn over. Well, at least here the professor has to fess up what was thought to be this page. It actually comes, but only from a generation later than Columba. This comes from a psalm book, which was enshrined in a relic kept by the kings of Galloway, who live close to Iona. The, where the relic was known as the Amhathach, um, Amkathach, um, the battler. Some would like the Ark of the Covenant for the ancient Israel. It would be carried into battle against the enemies. This may not have been exactly a use which St. Columba had intended for his copy of the Psalms, because don't forget, outside the almost utopian peace of the monastery, the Scotty, the Irish, later the Scots, had remained men of darkness. Their leaders remained fierce, bad rabbits. They still exulted in war. But the historian is grateful to these unreconstructed warlords for one thing, for they carefully enshrined in an early 7th century Irish psalm book in the solid, golden jewels of the relic case of their kathach, their, of their, their battler. Therefore, they preserved a perfect example of minute, correct Latin script. It is one of the most elegant and economical pieces of writing to survive from the last centuries of the Roman world. It's a very moving fragment. For here we have a Latin perfectly copied at Iona, unimaginably further north than from anywhere that any Roman had ever penetrated. It showed that, as far as the careful, loving preservation of Latin through the copying of the Holy Scriptures was concerned, in the time of Columba and in the succeeding century, Ireland, Iona, that great ark of Ireland, Scotland and Northern Britain, and no longer Rome and Latin-speaking continental Europe, was where the real action was. In my next two talks, I'll deal with the implications of this situation. I'm going to change their order. Next week, scribes, writing, books, and the very sudden emergence of a vernacular native culture. Fourth, as we get closer, sin and penance. We'll need it by then. <laughs> okay.